You'd think that when Muhammad offers his followers a guaranteed path to paradise in Islam's most trusted sources, modern Muslim scholars and imams would tell Muslims about this guaranteed path to paradise. But they don't tell them. They keep it a secret. Why is that? Are they trying to keep their followers out of Jannah? Do they think there won't be enough virgins to go around? What's going on here? I don't know. But if Muslim scholars and imams aren't going to tell Muslims about Muhammad's guaranteed path to paradise, their good friend D. Wood will. Because D. Wood cares. Now, there are some guaranteed paths to paradise that don't apply to Muslims today. For instance, in al-Bukhari's Al-Adab al-Mufrid 1183, we read, It is related that Abu Huraira said, I never saw al Hassan without my eyes overflowing with tears. That is because the Prophet, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, went out one day and I found him in the mosque. He took my hand and I went along with him. He did not speak to me until we reached the market of Banu Kainuka. He walked around it and looked. Then he left and I left with him until we reached the mosque. He sat down and wrapped himself in his garment. Then he said, where is the little one? Call the little one to me. Hassan came running and jumped into his lap. Then he put his hand in his beard. Then the Prophet, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, opened his mouth and put his tongue in his mouth. Then he said, Oh Allah, I love him. So love him and the one who loves him. Uh, according to another hadith, Musnad Ahmed 16,245, Muhammad would suck on the tongues and lips of little boys. But he explained why. He said he guaranteed that if he sucked on a little boy's tongue or lips, that little boy's tongue or lips would never be tormented by hellfire. So Muhammad was saying that if he sucked on a little boy's tongue or lips, that little boy was guaranteed paradise. That's a path to paradise that most people don't know about. But it's not relevant to most Muslims today, since most Muslims aren't tiny little boys, and Muhammad's not around to suck on their tiny little tongues and lips. We're looking for a path to paradise that's still available. And fortunately for Muslims, there are some paths to paradise that are still available. We all know that jihadis are guaranteed paradise, as Muhammad said in Sahih al-Bukhari 2787, Allah guarantees that he will admit the mujahid, the jihadi, in his cause into paradise if he is killed. Otherwise, he will return him to his home safely with rewards and war booty. But that's pretty common knowledge. We're looking for a path to paradise that Muslim leaders have kept hidden. Here's one, Sahih al-Bukhari 6807. Narrated Sahal bin Sa'ad, the prophet said, Whoever guarantees me the chastity of what is between his legs, i.e. his private parts, and what is between his jaws, i.e. his mouth, his tongue, I guarantee him paradise. The translator tries really hard to make this sound less creepy by adding some clarification in parentheses. He adds the chastity of his private parts and his mouth, his tongue. If we take out these additions, we see what Muhammad actually said. He said, whoever guarantees me what is between his legs and what is between his jaws, I guarantee him paradise. Now, this is something that Muslims should take very seriously. After all, their prophet is guaranteeing them a one-way trip to paradise if they simply guarantee him their penises, their testicles, their mouths, their tongues, and perhaps their buttholes, same general vicinity as the penis and testicles, but on the opposite side. When Muhammad guarantees you a one-way trip to paradise, you should listen if you actually believe he's a prophet. But what does Muhammad mean? Well, there are two ways to interpret this, and they're both really really bad. The first way to interpret this would be the sexual interpretation. Muhammad wanted his followers to promise him their private parts for all eternity, and he guaranteed them paradise so that they'd be able to keep their end of the bargain. 
We wouldn't normally go with such a disgusting interpretation, but when we examine Muhammad's life, there isn't much we'd put past this guy. He was a total pervert. The second way to interpret this hadith would be the shirktastic interpretation. This is the interpretation the translator was trying to present when he added the words, the chastity of. According to this interpretation, Muhammad was telling his followers to guarantee their chastity. But notice, Muhammad didn't say that people who guarantee their private parts to Allah are guaranteed paradise. He said that people who guarantee their private parts to him are guaranteed paradise. Whoever guarantees me, whoever guarantees me, whoever guarantees me what is between his legs and what is between his jaws, I guarantee him paradise. I thought Muhammad was just a messenger. Why is he telling his followers to promise their penises and testicles and mouths and tongues and, frankly, their buttholes to him rather than to Allah? He's just a messenger, right? You know what we call a messenger today? We call him a mailman. Muhammad is supposed to be a mailman delivering a message from someone else. Imagine a president or a prime minister, let's say the president of the United States, sending you a letter. The mailman brings you the letter. That was his job, getting the letter to you. But suppose the mailman all of a sudden says, hey, if you guarantee your private parts to me, the mailman, I can guarantee you a permanent room at the White House. Wouldn't you start thinking to yourself, wait a minute, you're the mailman. You deliver the message. You don't decide who gets to live in the White House. And it makes no sense to pledge our private parts to you. For someone who claims that Allah has no partner, Muhammad sure does act like he's Allah's partner. You don't promise your private parts to Allah, you promise them to a pervert, Muhammad. And if you promise your privates to a pretend prophet, he guarantees you paradise. Pretty impressive. Muhammad can just bypass the judgment of Allah and guarantee you paradise as long as you promise him your private parts. Clearly, if the shirktastic interpretation is correct, Muhammad is committing and promoting shirk, associating partners, namely himself, with Allah. He's trying to get his followers to pledge something to him that they should be pledging to God, and he's claiming that he's handing out tickets to paradise. Anyone who obeys Muhammad here is guilty of shirk. Again, there are only two ways to interpret this hadith. Either it's sexually perverted or it's shirk. Which is worse, according to Islam? Shirk is worse than sexual perversion. So Muslims shouldn't be trying to insert a pledge of chastity into this hadith. That would be shirk, because they'd be promising their private parts to a man as if their chastity is something they owe to that man. But this means that Muslims who don't want to commit shirk can only conclude that Muhammad was telling his followers that he wants their penises, their testicles, their mouths, their tongues, and, dare I say, their anuses for himself in paradise. I know it sounds revolting, but those are the only options. Either Muhammad was committing and promoting shirk, the unforgivable sin, or he wants his followers to promise him their privates for some presumably perverted purpose. To all my Muslim friends out there, assuming you don't want to accuse your prophet of shirk, I only have two questions for you. One, how bad do you want to get to Muhammad's paradise? And two, is it really worth it? <laughs> This is a powerful religion, there's a reason to it. Yeah? Yeah?